Now, say my name. The Rolling Bad Podcast. You're goddamn right. Welcome to the Rolling Bad Podcast, episode number 42. Coming to you from the desolate wasteland of Albuquerque, New Mexico, we're recording on March 10th, and I'm your host, Elric Edge, and with me is... Bill Costello. That's it, just the two of us. Yep. We'll touch on that here in a little bit, as well as all the other wonderful things we normally do. We've got a couple of great interviews lined up, with one with Chuck Moore, where we're going to be talking about the U.S. AOS Community Pack yeah. that we, both Bill and I, had our toes in. As well as an interview with Duncan and Eric from the Flying Monkey AOS GT in Wichita, Kansas, coming well, up. Flying in Monkey Convention. Convention, yes. Yeah, and uh, Eric was there for the AOS GT portion. Right. Yeah. In June in, in Kansas. So we'll cover lore and new stuff. And one of the things we want to talk about up front, is we're going to have minor change, major change. I don't know how you want to look at it to the show. We, it's just going to be Bill and I going forward. Uh, we're going to take the show in a slightly different direction and we'll work it out over the next couple episodes. We're going to be bringing in a lot of guest hosts. I know we've gotten a lot of requests to have Ryan, our Scottish correspondent, back on the show. He's going to be joining us again. He gives us Euro cred. Yeah. So, yeah. Street cred. <laughs> <you know>. Street cred. <laughs> uh, yeah. He, he, he's going to be pretty regular. Uh, we'll have other people on as well and not just like guest spots. It's, no. Uh, for interviews, there'll yeah. be people that join us for the entirety of the show. For the show. whole show and give their perspective on things. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, unfortunately, um, James is no longer on the Rolling Bad podcast. So, yeah. just uh, just our dulcet tones. Yeah. Like you said the last time, just the two of us. Building castles in the sky. Yeah, we should be musicians. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we're onto a song. We could be. We could be. <laughs> Taylor Swift, here we come. Uh, something like that. <laughs> Or we'll be the next Nickelback. Anyways. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I quit. Yeah. I quit. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's, let's, let's do, do a show. show. The Realm of the New Dawn. Where we're going to talk about all the new cool stuff from our favorite company in the whole wide world, Mantic Publishing. Oh, oh wait. No. Electronic Arts? <laughs> Yeah, another one of, oh, they made me so mad the other day. So I play two different games on the computer. Okay. I play Madden NFL on, you know, the PlayStation. Right. And I play uh, Star Wars Old Republic or whatever it is, you know, the uh, MMO on the computer. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I signed up for the stuff for Madden and I had to change the password for my EA account. So I change the password. Everything's fine. I go to play the Star Wars game on the computer, and I can't log in. And I can't change my password. And they won't email it to me. And I'm like, what is going on? Somebody hacked my account, and I'm really sad. Because I have all the eight characters at max, and I'm like, yeah, yeah. this was fun. Now it's not. <laughs> Come to find out, they're tied together. And when I change the password for Madden, it changed the password for uh... Star Wars. I was like, okay. Anyway, people didn't even want to hear that, but you no. get it anyway. So, but just be careful. If you sign up for Madden, your Star Wars account will be affected. Which might not matter for too much longer, because allegedly uh, Disney is shopping around for somebody else to do yeah. Star Wars games. Yep. So, that would so, be awesome, because EA can snack a fat one. <laughs> okay. Anyways. Tell us how you're really Yeah. Fat. So, anyway. Um, Let's talk about a different kind of game. So, in the in the realm of 40K, just a little thing dropped today which would be the codex tau yeah the greater good yep so fishmen have arrived <laughs> <laughs> yeah codex fishmen there you go uh, i've been reading the community articles on this fantastic man it's, it looks so, so cool. amazing and i had the opportunity to listen to uh forge the narrative paul murphy's podcast yep. and he's going over and in, in the podcast is split into two parts one before they had the actual book in their hand and then once they got the actual book and just you know it just sounds like it's such a it captures the flavor of tau without being the over-the-top tau that they were in late seventh edition 
And I mean, it just looks like it's going to be a balanced and B it's going to make all those Tau people, well, at least happier than they have been. Cause they really got hurt in the index. Yeah. Yeah. They got, they, they were, I think they got the worst treatment in the index. Everything was overpriced and undergunned. Yeah. It was just, it, they got, they got slapped around. They got beast claw raided. So, <laughs> yeah. so Dang. that's what dropped today a, yeah. along with, uh, in the age of Sigmar stuff, there's new daughters of Cain units that came out yep. today. And if daughters of Cain is your thing, my God, you're a happy little camper, right? The Warhammer community TV with, they had a uh, Ben Curry on there yeah, and you know, he kind of has a thing for. Well, okay, daughters, but Dark man, yeah. he just, you know, he did a really great explanation of why they're cool, what makes them cool, and a little bit on how to play them, although I, I kind of got this feeling that he didn't want to tip his whole hand, <laughs> you know, because he was about to play a game with Martin. So, yeah, it's a, it's a really good, if you have the Twitch Warhammer TV stream, that, that, hour long discussion they do with Ben Curry is really, really good. He really nails it. That's I think good. it's from someone that doesn't know Daughters of Cain all that well. Right. I learned a lot. That's good. So the other thing that came out today, uh the Realm of Battle Blasted Hollow Heart. Yeah. Which is the board and a little bit of scenery came out. I actually picked mine up today. I was gonna say I thought I saw you walking around. Yeah. I, I actually oh, put it under the desk. I'm sorry, I apologize, but um, it's, it's the same as the moon base classic classes for 40 K again, it is, it's not a four by six board. Yeah. It's actually like six inches short on the long side and four inches short on the, on the long side of six by four. But in reality, that's, we're talking minor. Yeah. I don't think it's that big of a deal. The number of times that I've played a game on a six by four and you <laughs> don't use like a third of the board. Exactly. So it's not a, I don't know. It's fine. It, it's not a thing. I mean, the, the drawback is it is a cardboard. It's very heavy, heavy stock. We're not talking yeah. cheap cardboard. It's very heavy, but it is cardboard. It's not a fat mat. So when you roll the dice, boy, everything shakes. And bounces. So, and yeah. I mean, it's even worse than with the Realm of Battle boards, the plastic boards. They really reverberate. So. You have to be careful when you're doing stuff like that, but they're still, they're fantastic deals for about the price of a fat mat. You're getting not just the board, but some terrain to go with it. Right. Now I'm not saying, you know how I feel about fat mats. They are, well, one of them should be arriving by post today because oh, nice. um, I bought another one. Those are definitely, that's the Cadillac of the field, but these, these boards are good yeah. and they do have that portability aspect that helps them. The other kit that came out today that we're concerned with is the Azurite Ruins, or Azurite, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, those ruin sets for AOS and kind of, at least in my world, going to be using them for Lord of the Rings as well. Yeah. Because I think they double really, really well. And I've heard some interesting comments that they're not area terrain and they're not line of sight blocking because they have such big holes in them from the doorways and the windows and all that. I don't know. What do you think? I don't, have, have you seen them? I I saw them on the website. I haven't seen them in person. Well, okay. So some of them, you know, have the windows and everything bricked in. That's line of sight blocking. Mm -hmm. And I th I don't think necessarily every single piece of terrain on a board has to serve a purpose for as far as like line of sight blocking and mm -hmm. stuff. And and this is definitely something you could set up in a small. You could you could set it up on a base. Yes. And then when you put it on the table. Say it's all one piece mm -hmm. and then roll something mystical for it or whatever. Right. For one chunk of it. Yeah. I mean, the terrain does what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't know what the issue is. I, I like it. It looks good. You I can, one of my thoughts was to take coffee stirrers slash popsicle sticks and board up some of those openings, you know, make it look thematic oh, yeah. as if someone had, you know, boarded them up because they are ruins. So. Yeah. You know, just put planks and boards up there as if someone had tried to barricade them to give that effect on some of the pieces, not all of them. So I think they'll, I think they'll fit in really well. Uh, yeah, I think they'll look good on the table for yeah. sure. And they're very, very themey. They're very, I, I think they're really a great kid. 
Great kit. Yeah, it's a solid amount of terrain, too, for 30 bucks. Mm-hmm. It's not bad. And, yeah. and yeah. considering whether you get it at your local game store with a discount or Frontline Gaming, you're getting 20% off of that. So you're only looking really at $20, $24. Yeah. So not bad. for the price of a pizza, you're getting six big pieces and some scatter terrain. Yep. It's not a bad deal. Uh, what else did we get? So last week, this thing came out from Black Library, which they call the Postcards, 20 Years of Black Library. And this is definitely not something you'll ever need for your game, ever. <laughs> yeah. Because they really are a set of, I think it's 120? No, 100 postcards. Okay. And all of them, have you seen them? I have not. Oh, shit. Take a look. All, all right. of them are covers of different Black Library publications or books or what have you. And I bought it simply for the nostalgia aspect of it, from remembering way back when to those were the covers of either White Dwarf or books that had come out. I mean, they have the very first one that when you first open it up is from the Troll Slayer magazine. So you're like, this is awesome. Really neat little thing. They're not very expensive, but, and they are really postcards. You can put a stamp on the back and an address and send it to someone who you like well, and hor- give them happy feels. Horus so. Rising. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. Oh, wow. God, so, some of these are some old books. Oh, yeah. And they have a bunch, of, and it goes right up at the bottom. There's a, uh, there's Stormcast Eternals. So it, it oh, covers nice. the whole 20, last 20 years. Of Black Library publications. So it's a really neat. I look at that as kind of an interesting maybe gift or something. Or just, like I said, something you might make a mural out of. Yeah, I already know exactly what I would do with it. What's that? Oh, we'll talk about that off the air. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> it's that dirty? Yeah. Ew. Okay. <laughs> something might be replacing the mirror on my bedroom ceiling. Nice. <laughs> what? No, I'll miss that. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm not supposed to say that. Uh, <laughs> so uh, the other thing that came out was the Warhammer 40,000 Ruled Journal. Yeah. <laughs> this is something that I do intend picking to pick up. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's pretty cool. It's, it's a diary. It's a journal. It's nothing more than that. Um, but it does have a wonderful little uh, saying from, you know, the 40K experience on every other page so you'll be reminded that you know an open mind is open to heresy things like that so again it's another one of those nice gifts for somebody that's into 40k you might put it on your wish list for a birthday or an event what have you but it's definitely not necessary and it's not the battle journals it's not set up to record games or anything like that so right and one of the thing I wanted to mention that the last uh when I was at the Warhammer store last week picking up some stuff and then the order that I made online they included the Black Library Celebration book which is just a quick little cheap paperback but it has a whole bunch of short stories in it from some pretty interesting authors uh David Geimer's in here Josh Reynolds is in here uh, John French is in here. So, I mean, there's some interesting little short reads in here. So, some Yeah, I think there's like a novel, or not a novel, but there's a story, I believe, that deals with Imperial Fists. Mm-hmm, I think so. What and, else have they pumped out? Well, they announced, and then unannounced, and then announced, and then walked back, and then announced a game, boxed game for 40K called Forgebane, which is going oh, to yeah. have the new Imperial Knight... I forgot what the the name of them, but the baby, baby Imperial Knights, Knights yeah. and something close to my heart, Necrons. Yeah. So it's basically a new starter box is yeah. what it looks like with Admech and Admech Necrons, and Necrons. Which is super cool. Yeah. It looks very, very cool. And I know when it was initially released, it looked like, it almost looked like a weird hybrid of Space Hulk where the Necrons were going to be on counters and it was Space Marines or something. But then that that seemed to go by the wayside. And then the pictures of the actual Forge Bane box came out and that looks more like an independent game that we're used to, like, you know, Death Watch and Overkill and Stormclaw where you get a decent amount of real kits. These are not, you know, push fit. These are actual kits to make actual 40K units. 
Yeah, it's also where you're going to get the new Necron. The new Necron model. Cryptic. Yeah. So I'll be buying probably six of those boxes. Because <laughs> I'm an idiot. So yeah, it happens. Yeah. Yeah, pretty badly. So other than that, I don't, is there anything else new coming um, down the pike? There's so there is a new 40K CCG that is coming out. It's it's digital, so it'll be kind of like Hearthstone. Oh, right. It's the combat cards digital stuff. version. Yeah. yeah. Um, it'll be a mobile game. I don't think a lot has been announced for it. They, they did that that kind of preview on the Twitch channel. Okay. Of the game, so there is a company called that makes a a product called the Table of Ultimate Gaming. They did a Kickstarter. They make these incredibly badass gaming tables. Yeah, they're they're a little pricey, but they are gorgeous. They have a deal now with Games Workshop to yeah. make uh, GW specific tables. So that's pretty sweet. 40K and AOS. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Themed. There is a game that got announced called Death Watch Tactics, I yeah. believe, or Space yeah. Hulk Tactics. Space no, Hulk Space Tactics. Hulk Tactics. Yeah. yeah. So. There's yet another strategy uh, style game coming out uh, based on Space Hulk, which <laughs> I mean, I'm really excited about. I, I'm just happy that there's more and more video games coming out set in in these worlds. I know there's Age of Sigmar games coming out. Yeah, with none none have been announced yet. It has been confirmed that there are development companies working on those. Vermintide Two. Mm-hmm. Has been getting a lot of buzz. A lot I saw of that on out. Chapter Master of Aldous is. Yeah. Dang, that looks. He had the trailer on there. Yeah. Man, he's got a couple play sweet. videos. I'm trying to think of what else as far as video games. It looks like Space Hulk Ascension is very close to being released for console. Mm hmm. Be very nice when that finally happens. Yay. I think that's all that I can think of off the top of my head. There's a lot of buzz There's for. The video game side. I'm telling so, you, there is. The, the licensing department is going nuts. Yeah, yeah. About a month or two ago when they had the two guys that are responsible for leasing out the IP and, and doing that legal stuff. Yeah, the guy and the gal. Yeah, yeah they were talking about all that. And uh, it sounds like they have a lot of plates spinning. Yes. You know, as far as putting out other uh, games. It was interesting the way when they were talking to her about, you know, what's the process. And she was real open about how if you have a game studio, you know, a, a for reals game studio, not, you know, Bill and Elric's Gaming Incorporated, as long as you have a relatively decent idea and your stuff fits the IP and you're not doing something dumb with it, they'll they'll license it. So, yeah, I, it there's a lot of stuff coming out. Makes me happy. Definitely. Definitely. It hits me in the feels place. Just so. waiting for the first AOS. Oh, me too. Game. It's going to be... Me too. It's going to be so good. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> yeah, be hopefully. Turn, but I, I think they've they've tightened it up a little bit. A lot of the games that have been coming out recently are a little higher quality. Yeah. So... Quite a bit. Yeah, I think that's... Uh, geez. That's a long creation, or a new dawn for not having a lot of stuff come out. Move on. All right. The Realm of Creation, where we're going to talk about what we've been up to in the hobby. Uh, I'll go first. Okay. So, I haven't done a whole lot. Last episode, I threw down the Nagash challenge with you. <laughs> yep. Seriously regretting that already. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine's still in the box, so. It's yeah, like I'm a little I'm bit ahead, ahead of you. Anything. Yeah, so, I've been working on Nagash, trying to get together the sub-assemblies, and I went to the GW store, bought up a bunch of the paints, for the first step in the Duncan video. Yeah, I kind of regret it because we got Colorado Clan Carnage team tournament coming up in July up in Denver. Yeah. I'm going to be taking death to that, but I'm not going to be using yeah. the gash. So all this time and energy is going into building and painting a model that You're I'm not going to use, use. When in reality, I need to be focusing on like painting 100 skeletons and Arcan yeah. and all of that stuff. So be working on... Try to pump him out. Yeah, well, you know. As quick as I can. So, should be good, though. He's an awesome model. I hate Nagash, you know, and everything he's about. Sure. But, God, that model is fantastic. It's just, it's it's such a gorgeous model. And I'm in the same boat, although for my death army, Nagash is going to figure quite prominently. So, because I just love that combination he has. 
But actually, I just love his new rules and the way he actually works on the table now. Yeah. So he's not a liability anymore. You're not anymore. paying full price for half rules yeah. in a match play game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And he's good. I mean, we'll talk. I'll talk about it in uh, Rama Battle, my recap of Mile High Massacre. Mm-hmm. I went up against Nagash, and he's he's, he's, not, he's a beast. not bad. So, yeah, that's all, I've, that's all I will be up to, yeah. most likely. And if I get burned out on him a little bit, I'll probably just put some other death stuff together until yeah. I jump back on it. So. It's just death from here on out. KO have been shelved. Mm -hmm. Have absolutely no desire to even look at that army ever again. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I'm done. And uh, yeah, just be death. Damn. Cool. Well, that's what you were aiming for. That's why you made the big buy. Yep. So for me, I have been working on my Rodigus model. So he's coming along pretty nicely. I've got a few more. Yeah, he looks good. Thank you. He's got a few more things to do. i got to paint the teeth and horns and... After that's done, I got to base him and pretty much call him complete and move on to something else. Such a disgusting model. Isn't it though? The great unclean ones. Yeah. Oh God. It just, the depth, the rips in the belly. Yeah. Just, it's, the, oh, it's so gross. So just, gross. Yeah. they It's one of those where they didn't go over the top. There's just enough to make it gross without being disgusting. Yeah. Unless you decide to paint it that way. And I've right. seen some, you know, guys put out really accentuating the gross parts and they look really good. <laughs> I mean, they do look yeah. super professional and, yeah. you know, it, it's just the limit on that model is almost, you know, way beyond what I can ever achieve painting wise. It's something else, man. Yeah. They are great. They are great. Also built up and primed the War Scar Citadel. Yeah. That's another, you know, it's a, it's a huge imposing terrain piece, but when you look at, look at it and break it down into what it is, really, it's just a big rock, some metal support structures, and then it's two cement, you know, two stone buildings. So painting it really is going to be, well, and the roofs, the roofs are going to be a little bit different, but painting it is really like four to five big chunks with some detail work. So it's not going to be that hard, and it's. I'm really looking forward to it. I've always wanted that piece of terrain. It's cool. Yeah, looks good. So be nice to have that on the table, painted. Yeah. Yep, it's going to be gorgeous. I hope. And then, last but not least, is my super secret project that nobody knows about. <clears throat> Tyrion is for 40k. Um, <laughs> that I'm not going to tell anybody about until I get it done. Yeah, it should be fun. <laughs> so we'll never see it. No, probably not. Right up there with your blood angels. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much right down that same same alleyway. Nice. No, actually, the 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 Tyranid army is going to be my get it on the table and tabletop it and play it. So you have something besides Necrons to push yeah. around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and I, I kept thinking about that because the way I want to do the Blood Angels and everything else, that's another one of those things. I want those to be my Seraphon of Age of Sigmar. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do them too fast. I have most Necron stuff already done. I have to do another unit of warriors, but that's no big deal. Yeah. I want to have an army that I can play for fun, and that's going to be Tyranids. So nice. Yeah, and they'll be tabletopped up shortly. I hope. You gonna do any of the specific the hype fleets? Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of leaning towards the way I, the way I've looked at everything, and the way I think I want to play it is more towards Kraken. I also like Kronos, but I think Kronos is a little too gimmicky for me. Okay. You know, it, it relies on a couple of tricky things, and I don't think I really play well that way. I think Kraken is a little more in your face. Hi, look at me. I'm moving faster than you think I can. And yeah. I'm in your face with all kinds of sighting talents. Hi. Nice. So, nice. Yep. That's my goal. All righty. Well, yeah, hopefully next episode. Oh, man. Yeah. Next episode will be post Adepticon. That's right. So hopefully I'll have uh, Nagash done, I guess. Yeah. He'll, he'll need to be close to finished. Yeah. If we're going to follow so. our our thing so yeah. yeah it'll be all in the gash all the time I'll, t- I'll try and get some pictures up on our social media yeah in progress once i actually start doing some stuff with them yeah you know you should probably do the same yeah and, and then we'll we'll post them both up side by side or whatever and let the finished people, let, product yeah. let the people vote see who they yeah. think <laughs> pulled it off because you do because I, I plan on doing the um the Duncan video. So mm-hmm. I'm going to follow the the paint scheme and all that. But you are thinking about taking them in a different direction. Yeah. All, all my stuff is done up in the the royal purple kind yeah. of stuff. Everything in my death army is kind of themed around that color scheme. And I don't want him to stand out against it. I, I was 
toying with the idea of doing the Duncan vid too, but I am going to do the Duncan video just with a different color base. Like the spirits and all that stuff are going to be like a super light pink fading back up into the into the cloak and all that stuff, which okay. is going to be Incubi Darkness. So it'll have that same kind of feel, but my ethereal stuff is going to be more purple. The armor is going to be more of a purple than the 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 black and the Incubi Darkness that he uses for the base of the armor. Hopefully I can carry it off because it's what I did with my Morgast yeah. and everything else. It's, it's just, you know, same exact techniques he's using, just different colors. Which right. is the beauty of their system is you can just put three different pots in front of you, just do it the same way. Yeah. And, you know, you, you'll end up with a very good result, so. All right, well, let's uh, jump into battle. Sure. I think we should. The Realm of Battle, where we're going to talk about our games we played. Bill and I played a test game yeah. that we were going for when we... What a mile, mile high, high massacre. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, Bill wasn't able to attend yeah. last minute. So I went up there with some of the other rolling bad guys and uh, talk about that experience. Yeah. But, our, uh, our game was quick. It was just to get used to. Yeah. I mean, we only did what, one and a half turns or something? It was two turns. Two uh, turns, yeah. Because we timed ourselves. We wanted to. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And oh, yeah. We were both using armies and stuff that we hadn't played before. I was mm-hmm. playing the uh, Gary Percival's one drop. KO Army, yeah. you were playing uh, a Nurgle yeah. list with all the new stuff they have. So we were trying to expose ourselves to that as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we and we play tested one of the scenarios, which was out of the uh, Malign Portents book, yes. actually. So turns out I played an illegal list. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I don't think it changed too Stinker. much. You still would have, you still would have had me, especially if you knew. Yeah, was, I, I did a big mistake with yeah. my Blades of Future. Vacation. Putrefaction. Putrefaction. Yeah. Yeah. And your, um, what was the other one? Oh, the Glocken. Yeah. 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 I've decided he actually came out of the list after that. Yeah. I, think I mean, he would have gone up to mile high because that was the submitted list, but I just, yeah, he didn't play. He wasn't the thing I thought he was going to be. So Yeah. He's, he's still pretty pricey, but it's kind of hard to do, to price something like that because he's so big. He does so much, mm-hmm. but then- when you put a big price tag on him, it's like, well, I feel like I could get more mileage out of taking other multiple small things. Yeah, and that's the whole thing is is for what I wanted him to be was the outlier. Yeah. For speedy getting to things and beating it up, I'll be better off with some Blight Drones and Puscoil Blight Lords. Thank you, Andrew. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're almost as tough. They have more wounds than he does, but they'll also have that speed, that ability to get around a lot better. It's interesting. I mean, I'm not trying to badmouth the Glockin because he does no, have no. a way to fit in, but just not the way I want to play that list. Sure. So, so yeah. Um, so talk to me about Mile High. Yeah, we ended up going up to Mile High. Andrew and I drove together, met up with a bunch of the our, our other Rolling Bad member with Ryan and immediately proceeded. Oh, and, and Scott, Scott Reed the LV, from LVO. And uh, proceeded to talk copious amounts of crap with the Denver Deuces guys. Uh, so Gee, good. I didn't see that coming. Yeah, <laughs> so good. So I'll just jump straight into to my games. I'm not going to do a blow by blow. I'll just talk about them. Uh, I, like I said, I took uh, Gary's one drop list. It was uh, Barrick Zilfin. Uh, there's no trading with some people. Yeah. Two chemists, a navigator crammed into an ironclad, nine engine riggers, nine sky wardens, three units of 10, Arcanaut Company, and the Iron Sky Command formation. My first game, I played a guy named Jacob Kurz. I think he's new to AOS. I think he's more of a 40K guy. Yeah. Uh, he was playing a murder host. Oh, wow. And on paper, it was when the lists were submitted, he had a full murder host. And so I had spent like the week leading up to the event kind of racking my brain mm-hmm. of, uh, you know, how is this going to go? And talking with some of the other big names in in the the KO European yeah. tournament scene with, with KO and whatnot. And when I actually got to the table, unfortunately, he didn't have two units of dogs. Oh, wow. So it was only six units of corn, so he didn't get the full benefit. So I ended up dropping down behind his army popping out and this one was it was a malign portents mission i can't remember what it was called but basically the board was set up where you're playing narrow into narrow end oh yeah kind of like a battle edge for the edge, pass yeah. yeah 
and it had four objectives and like a diamond pattern. And the objective in your territory was worth more to your opponent than it was to you. It was worth yeah. one to you, four for your opponent, right. two on the sides, and switched. So I dropped in the back, unloaded all my shooting, killed 15 blood letters. Oh, geez. And a uh, blood secretor, all my shooting. <laughs> wow. I was like, okay, uh, this is cool. And then I should, I should say, before I go too far in, so we had the missions, and then the way they do things in Denver for a lot of their stuff is they have these uh, mission cards yeah. as well. Yeah. And they have – they're set up in three stacks. There's easy, medium, and hard. And you get different points for pulling different cards and, uh, and completing those objectives. So the easy ones are like uh, make an armor save, mm -hmm. um, make a, a battle shock test, a successful yeah. battle shock test. Really simple, but they're worth like hardly any points. But if you do it every round, you can kind of consistently yeah. get yourself a few extra points here and there. Uh, the mediums are a little more difficult. Some of them are like, uh, I remember one was make a nine inch, eight or nine inch charge, mm. but it was exactly that. Oh. You had to roll that amount. Oh, wow. Just okay. weird, weird stuff like that. Uh, some of them are like successfully cast three spells. So for, yeah, for some yeah. armies, it's going to be really hard for some, for impossible for some, mm -hmm. uh, really easy for others, but you could also burn the cards right. for different abilities. So you could burn an easy and get an extra D3 to a casting value, a run value, or a charge value. Oh, that's nice. Uh, you could burn a medium to automatically cast a spell that couldn't be unbound to unbind a spell. I think there was like one other ability. I can't remember you could do. And then the, bre the hards, you couldn't. You couldn't burn. You had to complete Oh, you them. had to do them. And years ago when we were playing 8th edition, we went up there for a team tournament with one of the guys. Or, you know, one of the guys on our team, phenomenal player. I wish he played Age of Sigmar, but he's kind of since faded from tabletop gaming. He went up there and drew a hard round one and accomplished it. And then drew a hard for round two and accomplishment. And he sat there and he was like, just pull hards. Everybody on the team just pull hards. Yeah. Because... They're, they're really, really hard to complete, but you usually get a bonus yeah. to do it. And so that's what we started doing after that. And I went into this tournament. Thinking the same. Do, yeah. I was yeah. like, I'm just going to pull hearts the whole time. Yep. So that's what I did. For example, my first card that I pulled, I can't remember what it was called, but it, the objective was kill three units with flaming attacks. Oh, boy. Okay. The blessing that it gave you was pick one of your units. That unit has flaming attacks, which gives them plus one to hit. <laughs> and then the secondary reward on there was if the unit survives, you got like an extra 200 victory points or something like that, uh, which was another thing used to separate because we used kind of like a, a 20 nil type yeah, separation yeah. thing for additional points. The, the Denver guys like to do, instead of like 20 points max, they do a 20 points for winning the scenario and then additional points for right. point spread and then additional points. points for the cards. Yeah. So you can get a lot of points, but it's cool because it creates better separation. Yeah. Too. And I, so I asked the guy running and I asked uh, Chad, I said, Hey, so do I have to do the killing blow with this unit? Do I have to do all the wounds with this unit? And he said, well, you're going to have to do all the wounds with that one unit to kill. <laughs> you know, if, if you do a bunch of wounds and they battle shock off, that still counts. Yeah. But if you like, shoot with some other unit, do a couple wounds, and then, and then charge and kill, off, yeah. it doesn't count. I was like, oh, boy. Ugh, that's tough. This is going to be rough, especially against a murder host. Yeah. So I gave my engine riggers, you know, my nine engine riggers, the flaming attacks, because yeah. hitting on twos, wounding on twos, red sure. two, D3. They have the best chance. Good stuff. So, yeah, turn one, I, I shot the world and killed 15 blood letters and a character. A little disappointing. And then uh, charged the engine riggers into 30 blood letters. <laughs> <laughs> and absolutely <laughs> annihilated them. Oh, no. So his turn two rolls around. I'm sitting there looking at 75 blood letters still Jeez. on the table. <laughs> After annihilating. <laughs> yeah. God. They're only like nine inches away from my army. Oh, no. And I'm like, oh, boy. This didn't go the way I thought it would. <laughs> so he moves up uh, 30 blood letters and surrounds the engine riggers. And then, which are on the other side of the table, they, they'd use their grapnels to go over. Oh, to, to move kind of over. fight yeah. a different, different side. The main bulk of my force was facing off against a bunch of blood letters too. And they, they got in and it was just a slugfest. And he wasn't rolling too hot. He also forgot some of his rules. He, like I said, he was really new. And, mm. and I was trying to remember 
all of my stuff. It's been a long time. I played Corn yeah. when AOS first dropped. Right. I haven't played it since. So I was too busy trying to remember all my stuff to remember. His extra tests. Yeah, and like all that having stuff. Did more than 20 yeah. models or whatever. Right. And, and all this stuff. He wasn't doing too hot. And then on the other side, Moved up his in, his his blood letters around the engine riggers, three inches away, and rolled snake eyes for the charge. Oh my god! And I was like, oh, oh no, oh, oh, yeah. So then I proceeded to take him off, but <laughs> oh. it was it was so close. Um, but yeah, I ended up pulling out a, a pretty massive one. I got like thirty eight out of forty points total mm. for the whole thing. Uh, second. Second round, I played uh, Kyle Bennett, who was playing Sylvaneth. Hmm. Yeah, so you know, every time I go up against Sylvaneth, everybody's got to get their jokes in. Of course. And um, he was playing. You can't win this. Yeah, <laughs> he was playing a gnarl root, but he didn't have a household. Or wait, no, he didn't have. He had household. He didn't have. Uh, there's another formation that people usually took with that, but you can't take it now because it's so many points. And he had like a big unit of 30 dryads, stuff like that. I think this was the other Malign Portents one, but it was like a fancy version of Take and Hold. Oh. We'll, we'll, we'll go with that. So he deployed his characters, his five-man unit of Tree Revenants and uh, a unit of 10 dryads out. And then he left his 30 dryads and his unit of Kurnoth Hunters in the woods. To come back, to come on later. Right. So I'm sitting there trying to think of like, you know, do I want to drop? Do I want to, I just, so I just set up normally and then took first turn. Yeah. Oh, we both had one drop armies too. So it all came down to that first roll. Oh boy. Which I won. <laughs> Woo. Set up the boat, used my once per game, moved forward, dumped everything out, did the standard. Uh, charged the engine riggers into his Tree Lord Ancient. The Sky Wardens went after his Branch Witch. That's I think. a good kill. Yeah. Yeah. And they had Durthu, Drycha, and that was pretty much it. So, turn one, I managed to kill the Tree Lord Ancient, Drycha, the Branch Witch, and the five Tree Revenants. That's game over. So, he had all he had left on the table was Durthu and 10 Dryads. And then he had his 30 Dryads and Kurnoth Hunters in the woods and, and he had only put one woods out on the table out on the middle oh, you know the one no. you start with yeah and he was debating about putting three pieces down or just two for it he decided to go with three which saved him because i was sitting there talking to him i was like you have to you have to be x amount of inches away from my stuff but still within x amount of inches of your trees to right. bring those on right he's like yeah like, so if i just move over there you can't bring any of that stuff on. He's like, no, no, I can't. I was like, oh. So I tried to get, I tried to shuffle over as fast <laughs> as I could. I was thinking 30 dryads would be a big enough footprint that he couldn't yeah. bring them on. And uh, no, I left him just, just enough, just enough to have this little <laughs> crescent shape of dryads with a couple of Kurnoth hunters sm S you know, sprinkled uh, in. stuffed in there. <laughs> so he managed to bring his whole army on. He still had Durthu, who, which was minus one to hit. Yeah. Durthu with minus one to hit with an army that generally hits on fours. Yeah. It's, it's real. Tough. Like, yeah, that was difficult. I'm trying to remember what my mission card for this one was. I think it was, I th oh, I think I had like three dogs. It gave me a unit and those three dogs had to get into my, or had to survive the game or something like that. And they were pretty fragile. They were basically like um, the Beast Claw Raider Frost Sabers. Yeah, the Frost Sabers. Yeah, they were just basically those. Um, yeah, they're fragile. Yeah, and I, I just stuffed them behind a building. Mm -hmm. Just kept them out of the way. I was like, yeah, that's where they'll stay for now. Yeah, the, the game proceeded on, and he didn't do too hot with Durthu. He, only, he pretty much smoked a unit of Sky Wardens by himself and then moved up. I think it was like three inches away from engine riggers. Oh, oh. Ow. Got ready to roll the charge. Oh no! <laughs> Snake, Snake eyes, eyes again. <laughs> Two different people. Oh my god! Yeah, he failed. He failed the charge. Failed uh, that and a charge with the Kurnoth hunters to get into the engine riggers. Wow. Yeah. So I was able to. I, I had to focus a lot into Durthu because I'm yeah. like, he's got to go down. Uh, that guy hits hard enough that he could. He could still. I don't think he could win. The game, but he's going to make me. He's going to wipe a unit at a time. Yeah, yeah, so. exactly. So, oh, but with the 30 dryads, I think he, he still had a chance. But, um, you know, Durthu not getting the extra D3 attacks, being around a forest and stuff yeah. like that. He just 
wasn't quite enough by himself to to pull it out. I ended up tabling him and getting 39 out of 40 Damn. points out of that one. So yeah, after round two, I was at the top of the pack by so what i'm what i'm getting from all of this is when you have a competitive army you kind of don't suck well i mean <laughs> i guess it's maybe <laughs> maybe uh it also helps when people roll snake eyes for their charges that's a good point <laughs> so yeah round three i had to play andrew our our andrew and he took his storm cast we didn't take a vanguard wing he just took kind of like a Took a hodgepodge kind of thing. Kind didn't of he? a hodgepodge, but it had a lot of. I mean, well, it's hard to write a bad stormcast yeah. army. They, so they have flexible. a lot of good they stuff do, in there. Yeah, and and doesn't help that he knows what he's doing. <laughs> and this was another long, oh, board, long way, long yeah. deployment way. Well, that favors you though, because no, um, it, no, it doesn't allow me to shift. For, so that's true. The gimmick of the can, army is like I can deploy in one spot, right? And, and then, then with Fleet Master, I can completely throw it off. I can either jump back up in the sky, I can right, jump to the other he side. He has the benefit of being able to cover with less units, right? And um, yeah, so it kind of screwed. Me. And the the table had a lot of of huge rock formation type oh things, so yeah. it was it's kind of a pain in the ass that way. And uh, he left seven units up in the sky mm. to come down later. And he just barely put a couple guys, you know, liberators and stuff out, mm-hmm. his more chaffy units yeah. to not leave me any bubbles that I could bring down the, drop the boat down. Sure. In. So I told him, I said, you know, the, when we started the game, I was like, leaving those seven units up in the sky is either what's going to cost you the game or it's what's going to pretty much win you the game. They're either all going to come down like turn one or they'll just come down piecemeal right. through the rest of the game. I'll be able to to pick them off as they come up. And this mission was just all about getting units into your appointments, deployments there, oh, uh, yeah. area. Uh, and you got more points That's the, the further you got. Yeah, yeah. You got more points the, the further you got in. Characters were worth more. Or heroes were worth, were worth yeah. more. Stuff yeah. like that. In this one, my card was kill all your opponent's non-hero units. Wow. Uh, blood, it was called Blood for the Blood God. Had to kill all your opponent's non-hero units. Your benefit was your all your battle line got to reroll one to hit, but you had to sacrifice a hero before the game even started. Ow. Yeah. Yeah. Ow. So <laughs> so the navigator got toast toasted off the off the off the bat before. So we long even, I hardly knew you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I just so we started playing and he deployed his stuff in such a way that I couldn't optimize my shooting and it was going to basically put my army exposed. And I was trying to stick cause he had two Dracoths and a uh, Lord Celestin on Dracoth. Either of those units can hit my army hard enough uh, that it'll kill anything it touches. Even the engine riggers, if I don't get to fight first. Right. So, you know, I'm trying to play a little cagey with those guys so that I can dictate how that combat goes. And sure enough, t- his turn one, five of the seven units dropped, uh, which was like two units adjudicators, a unit of long strikes, uh, and like two units of prosecutors. So a whole yeah. bunch of shooting. Right. Dropping down nine inches away from my army, and he just lit me up. Did so much damage that I just couldn't recover from it, basically. He needed to make an eight-inch charge with a unit of liberators to tie up the engine riggers, and of course he rolled and eight. Of it course. just barely made it in. And, it, <laughs> and I just couldn't, I couldn't move away fast enough at that yeah. point, like to try to, to do what I needed to do. I, and my guys were just dropping so fast. I mean, the Stormcast shooting is so good. So good. It it doesn't have the same, I don't even want to say it doesn't necessarily have the same volume. That stupid Skybolt bow mm-hmm. that does D6 hits. Yeah. So, it's so good for five dudes shooting bows. You can get all 11 hits. Yeah. Or, 10 hits, but the, the quality of their shooting. That's where is, they get. Yeah. yeah. It's such that, you know, he was shooting my sky wardens and my engine riggers with his long strikes. And every time he rolls a six to hit, that's two more to wounds. Well, that's just a guy dead every time. Right. And then every wound that gets through is two damage at rend one. So I'm only saving on a five. So, I mean, he just, every, basically every shot is pulling a model off and yeah, it was just rough. So, Ended up tabling me uh, and taking a pretty, like a max win off of it. That was the end of day one. 
So we went to a Mexican restaurant, which is funny. Take a bunch of dudes from New Mexico out to a Mexican restaurant. Yeah, that's in you Colorado. <laughs> in, yeah, in Colorado. Food was good, though. Food was good, and they had margaritas the size of our heads. Those that always helps. Gigantic fish bowls of margaritas. <laughs> um, so I <laughs> think the bill, there was, I don't know, there was like uh, uh, maybe not even quite a dozen of us. <laughs> the bill was like 350 bucks or something like that. How much of it was alcohol? Uh, <laughs> like half of the bill. Okay. Like yeah. Half of the bill was alcohol. So <laughs> yeah, good times. So the post, you know, the pairings and stuff got posted that night before we left. And I was going to be playing a guy named Randall Nelson and, uh, he had a Nagash list. Oh boy. So I'm sitting there thinking about it and I'm like, this is really my game to lose. It was a uh, gift, not gift from the heavens, the new star strike. Oh, yeah. It was star strike. So, um, I'm like, well, I'm, I'm quick enough that I can get around to objectives, whatever. Nagash conveniently flies. Yeah. He does. So Barak Zilfin, I'm rerolling ones to yeah, hit and right. ones to wound against flying units. And he's not a one drop. So I'll, I'll get to determine who goes first, which I'll take the first turn before he can cast a bajillion spells. Yeah. So I'll give a little back history to this game because okay. <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny. Back when the End Times came out up in Denver, they ran an event called Lost Souls and they used the End Times rules. Right. So it was like bananas level tournament. Yeah. Everything and goes. I took, yeah, I took Empire with Carl Franz, the Ascendant Carl Franz. And it was, it was a hardcore list. You know, there was people bringing mixed elf lists, mm -hmm. mixed chaos lists. Sure. I mean, there was some nasty stuff. I smashed like my first four opponents uh, going, I was four and zero going into the last round, <laughs> feeling pretty good. <laughs> and here comes this guy, Ruperto, playing Nagash. Okay. <laughs> and this was back when Nagash was unlimited. He could basically he could summon, summon a new army every, every turn, turn. Yeah. dice permitting. So, you know, we're setting up our armies and I'm getting in my head a little bit. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh man, oh man, this, what I man got, I, I have to kill Nagash. Turn one or else yeah. it's over. Like I won't stand a chance right. against him. The game starts. I, I get the first turn and I moved Carl across the table to like three, four inches in front of, of Nagash. Oh no. And the look on Ruperto's face should have told me that was the right move because it shook him. But then I was like, well, on his turn, he'll shimmy out of the way and I can't catch it. He'll be out of my angle. Right. You remember? Yes. The like, angles this, in the old there's this hundred foot tall thing standing next to me, but I, I technically can't see him because rank and flank is fun. Anyways. <laughs> um, <laughs> no bitter. So I was here. like, well, <laughs> so I'll, I'll back up. I got to back up a little bit. And then I started, oh, started measuring the angle. So there was no way that he could get away from me. And when I did that, I had moved back a substantial amount. I could still make any charge. I still had him. Right. But anyways, and, the, and again, the look on his face should have told me I done, I done effed up. Yeah. So it goes to his turn. Boom. hundred zombies in between me and the yeah. cash. He's like, congratulations. You will never get to me. Yeah. And I was just like, crap. <laughs> so we, we play the game, continue playing. The yeah. Game. This is where the important part comes. Cause I used to, have, I also had a cav bus, huge cav bus, yeah. inner circle nights, bunch of characters, nasty. And he moves Nagash into a place where I can charge him with the cab oh, bus. Oh, boy. And I get him. And I get greedy and try to cast two different buff spells <laughs> with my level four of life <laughs> to guarantee that I bring down Nagash and get neither of them off. Oh. Whereas if I had just thrown six just dice at one, one, you would have got it. I would have had it. Swing on Nagash, get him down to one wound left that's not enough not enough oh not enough nagash smashes me the morgas smash me oh, everything God. he summons yep. i lose the game lose the tournament oh so as fate would have it my next experience with nagash <laughs> who's on the table next to me ah roberto oh, good old roberto <laughs> who's just laughing <laughs> Loving it. Hey, buddy. Yeah. Remember him? <laughs> so I'm like, all right, well, I won't make that mistake again. Spoiler alert, I made that you mistake made again. <laughs> so we start off, I take the first turn, and I'm like, I'm going to pump everything into Nagash, and I got to bring him down. And then after that, there's still a 100 skeletons to deal with, but 
that should be okay because they won't be they won't be immune to battle shock. Yeah, that's right. All this other stuff, right? All their good stuff is gone. Yeah. I start my first turn. I'm like, I got to put everything in into Gash. Got to kill him because his command ability is going to be yeah. nasty. His spells are going to be nasty. Everything about but him is nasty. His furthest range is, he has one spell that's 24 inches. Everything mm-hmm. else is 18 or less. So I figured as long as I'm 19 inches away from Nagash, he can't hit me in his hero phase with all his nasty spells. So if I don't kill him, I'll still be okay because, uh, I mean, he could charge me or whatever. Right. You know, but he can't hit me with these crazy that debuff crazy spells good. that death yeah. have. I do all my shooting and all of that. And I don't send the engine riggers in because I don't want to, I don't want to, I played conservatively. You didn't want to overkill. And I got Nagash down to one wound. Oh, God. And Rupecta's just laughing. I bet he's just, just laughing at me. <laughs> so I had a chance to, in the movement phase, I could have moved, if I had rolled well on the D3 additional movement from my navigator, mm-hmm. to put my boat in front of my army. In a, tr- in a little, because we were playing on another one of those tables with these huge ass rock formations mm-hmm. and there was a choke point and I could have put the boat right there between me and Nagash. And I thought, well, no, I don't want to do that because the boat is fast enough that for Star Strike, I might, ni- I might need, need it, it to go get objectives yeah. later. And yeah. so I didn't. And I played conservatively and left that gap. Nagash comes through. He tries, he tries casting a couple spells. None of them go through. Mm-hmm. He moves up and charges me. And even with a single wound left, still manages to almost kill an entire unit of Indrin Rickers. Yeah. Because he's still giggling about the one wound left. Yeah. And then he, he kind of like shuffles up his hordes behind that. Sure. N- none of them make charges into me. Turn two, I finally kill Nagash with the Indrin Rickers. I'm sitting there like, I don't have enough at this point to get rid of the skeletons. These hundred skeletons that are about to come through. So I, I tried to shoot him. I tried to, oh, and he also had a uh, mortis engine that flew over one of these huge rock formations. And mortis engines are are for real. Yes, like they it are. was dumping mortal wounds onto everything yep. around it. They're beautiful. Yeah. And um, yeah, at that point I was, I was done. And uh, 40 skeletons charged in my army and killed almost my entire, entire KO army. 40 skeletons. Mm-hmm. Hitting on threes, wounding on threes. Yeah. I was just like, Wow. Once they're buffed up, and I they they're, weren't they're even no buffed. Joke. They weren't even buffed. It was just the benefits from the uh, from their war scroll. Yeah, when they have so many models, when they have yeah, they attack better and have more attacks, and yeah, and when your whole army's saving on like fives, mm-hmm. yeah, it just took me off. Wow. And, uh, yeah, he ended up tabling me, even though I I did manage to kill Nagash. That was it. And my my mission card was <laughs> I had the emissary of Nagash, oh. <laughs> which was basically a uh, Cairn Wraith that healed himself when he killed models, and I had to get him into my opponent's deployment zone. He didn't make it. Oh, poor fella. So my last round. So now you're two and two. I'm two and two. Damn. I'm, I'm like, man, what the hell? So game five, get paired up with Iron Jaws. Oh, you know how and they I'm play. like, okay. <laughs> All right. This is like my day of yeah. remembrance. Like, okay, whatever. <laughs> and so I start talking to the Iron Jaws player before we start. And he's like, I said, so what are you saying? Are you also two and two? He's like, no, I'm three and one. And I was like, what? You're three and one with Iron Jaws? He's like, yeah, man, I, I'm doing okay. And blah, blah, blah. And he, he, the game he had played before was against our beloved Randall. Not not the Randall that I had played, obviously. Right. Our, uh, our Randall Hill. Randall Hill. Um, who... Uh, <clears throat> Is garbage at Warhammer. Oh. <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> <That's laughs> I told, nice. told him we'd give him a loving shout out. Double croak. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Learn how to build a list, noob. Double slant. Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, three and one with Iron Jaws. Because there was some good lists up there, mm-hmm. you know, and, and whatnot. So I was pretty impressed. I was like, damn, dude, if you beat me uh, and go four and one with Iron Jaws, I'm going to be really, really impressed. <laughs> And uh, so we we start playing. <laughs> Turns out there might be a reason he went three and one. He thought all his abilities lasted until his next hero phase. Uh, no. And I was like, no, no, dude, that's not. Yeah, that's not how that works. And I guess his opponents that he had been playing, Iron Jaws aren't really a thing anymore. So yeah. they didn't. You don't know. face them all. That, and all and that literally, much. literally every other army in the game, their abilities that's stay right. until the beginning until of your the next beginning hero of your phase. Next... I can get that nobody caught this. And you he, always you know, assume thought, it. 
Yeah. yeah. And he thought, oh, well, you know, surely my stuff does this, does the same. And I'm like, no, none of that stuff carries over. That's why Iron Jaws live and die by the double turn. That's right. Because it's the only way you're going to get multiple turns of, of, of your buffs. buffs. Yeah. I had to inform him on some of that stuff. So I went first, moved up my army, and this was three places of power. He had a Maw Crusher, Foot Boss, Shaman, and a War Chanter. And so I'm looking at his army and I'm like, uh, and the way he deployed, and there was this huge, huge piece of terrain. It was this pyramid thing in the middle of the table, like kind of obnoxiously large. Oh yeah, I've seen that one. Yeah. yeah. Well, there was there was a few tables that had them. Yeah. And so it kind of split the table in a way. Mm-hmm. And so I just piled up on one side across from his Maw Crusher and I was looking at, he had a Maw Crusher and his Shaman next to that. And he had three Gorkrantas and 10 Ard Boys and then 10 Brutes, which I was like, I don't necessarily don't want to get run tangled into, into those. Yep. With the Foot Boss and the Chanter next to them. And then two more units of Ard Boys kind of strung out further down. He was, you know, had this huge line deployment. And I was like, so I'm going to start this off and I'm just going to smash this one side. I'm going to kill the Ard Boys, the Shaman, the Maw Crusher, the, and the Gorgruntas all in one go. And that should cripple him enough that he's probably out of it. Yeah, because he won't have the rest heroes of the stuff. Left. Well, you still have two heroes to my three, but, but he's still. slow enough that I'll probably get another round of shooting against him and probably take the rest of it off. So dump everything out, move it into key positions, give the buffs, do all my stuff. I shoot and then I charge with my engine riggers and I killed two art boys and his shaman. Oh my God. All of my shooting. Oh my God. Everything. Endrin riggers into his Maw Crusher, hitting, re-rolling ones to hit, re-rolling ones to wound. Oh my God. I did. I got five wounds through, five D3 damage, five, rolled five ones. Oh my yeah. Lord. So I'm just sitting there. Holy. And I'd come off of a, off of a disappointing loss against Nagash that I should have had. Mm-hmm. If I if I had just been a tiny bit more aggressive, I probably would have had that game. And I'm just sitting there thinking like, really? That's the best I could do against Iron Jaws? Oh, that hurts. <sighs> okay. <laughs> but, you know, I had, I moved my characters onto one of the objectives, so I got points. I got one point. Uh, and then he goes... He swings and charges and does all this stuff. Doesn't kill all the engine riggers. So there's still some engine riggers on his mock Russia, which kept his mock Russia from getting into my lines. Yeah. And then he gets gets in with the brutes, the Ard Boys and the Gorgruntas, basically oh, into my whole army. And I'm like, oh crap. Okay. He does his turn, kills a bunch of stuff, but I'm still hanging on. We get to the priority roll. I'm like, if I get this priority roll, I'm still in it because he didn't yeah. kill quite enough stuff. Yeah. He gets the double turn. I'm oh. just like, come really? on. Really? <laughs> uh. <laughs> All right. But he didn't score any points. Ah. Okay. No, he's too busy trying to get you. Yeah. 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 And, and he's too busy running up this pyramid. He put his characters in bad spots. And there's one set of stairs up the pyramid mm-hmm. and then the rest of them are like these huge sure, like yeah. two inch sections that we were moving up and over up and over and a movement four it's kind of difficult yeah. for for those guys to get up there we go into round two he's fighting me and does you know he kills a bunch more stuff but i hang in there the two uh, the two chemists are sitting there giving out their minus one attack debuffs and stuff like that which is keeping me in yeah. um <laughs> and then we get to the end of that round and I'm, I still have models and I'm like, okay. So then we go into my round two and, um, yeah, that's when my decide my shooting decided like, oh yeah, I guess, oh. I guess this is what we're supposed to do. Oh, are we supposed to be? So gotcha. I dropped his war chanter. I killed the gore gruntas. I think I killed the brutes, the ard boys, with what was left, I didn't have a whole lot left. The Maw Crusher was still there. And, of course, I still had my heroes on the objective. Yeah. Yeah, I ended up winning that game. Just I, I just managed to stay one point ahead of him with the yep. chemists on the on the objective. Yeah. And I was just like, oh, my God, man. If I go down to Iron Jaws, I'm going yeah, to quit gotta, this stupid game. you got to hang your head. I'm just going to go, yeah. I'm going to go play. To death, lose to Iron Jaws? Yeah. No. Sell all my stuff off and play Overwatch or something <laughs> the rest of my garbage life 
Because I mean, he was a cool guy. Don't get me wrong, and he and he was playing well. I'm not. I don't want to take anything away from him, but like, there's no reason yeah. Iron Jaws should have even posed a minor threat to you, that yeah. list. And that when I rolled all those dice and killed three models, when you do five D three worth of damage, you do five points. That was the second time something. that tournament that had happened too. <sighs> there's something wrong, and it was just like, oh man, wow, that so, hurts. Well, yeah. at least you won though. I uh, managed to pull out the win. I went three and two. Three and two. I had four. It, I was really happy because I had four really cool games with four Denver guys. You know, I mean, I, you know, I played Andrew, but he, he's here. Yeah, I play him whatever. Yeah, so it was it was awesome to get to play those guys up there. Yeah, and see that there's a lot of new guys in the scene up there, mm-hmm. but there are some some of those new guys are like competitive dudes that know how to play the game, like Randall. Right. So I'll, I'll go into the placings. Or the the awards. Gee, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> so best overall went to Andrew. Yep. Andrew went five and zero oh with his Stormcast, and then best general went to Randall Nelson, the Nagash player that I played. Oh, nice. Yeah. Which was based purely on uh, I think battle points. Um, he got the most. Best painted went to Kyle Bennett, the Sylvaneth player I played. Against, oh, yeah. Which I maintain that he should have been disqualified because he put his his uh Alarial out with his army even though Alarial wasn't in, in, his, in list. his list i was like ah oh, oh, cheeky oh. move trying to put the eye catching put the hot sexy, centerpiece babe. out there i see how, i see your game sure i'll build a marathi for my death <laughs> army then <laughs> right. you know Man, there was some yeah. really good armies up there and his was definitely one of them nice like i mean that's why i say like i hate sylvaneth but damn they look good on the table uh, you know yeah a well-painted sylvaneth army is a beautiful thing yeah so and then I won Best Tactician, yep. which was the person who got the most mission points right. off the cards. So, which, you know, that's why I went with red every time. Mm-hmm. And so, as I was saying, there's a bunch of new players out there, but some of them are, are really, aren't like new to AOS. They're just new to that area. Right. And they, they want to kind of bring the competitive level up, uh, up a little, which I, I'm really cool with because, you know, back in eighth edition, the mountain region kind of got crapped on for being a bunch of players that didn't know what we were doing blah 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 and yeah i think that's that's not fair to us because i think we have some players here that if they had gone to the masters and stuff would have done incredibly mm-hmm. incredibly well uh so hopefully we'll see that with aos moving forward yeah. but um yeah I, like i said i have four great games with with the guys that live up there it was just, uh really cool it it got me motivated again for playing in events as yeah. opposed to just running them. Yeah. Um, part of me regrets not going to Adepticon to play, um, but that's fine. I wanted to go up there and get a different experience anyways. Well, and so, plus having the experience of, of helping to run something that size can only help in the long run. So, yeah, yeah, you know. definitely. And, it, yeah. And, I'll, and I get to compare that with my LVO experience of sure. helping there as well. Yep. So, yep. Um, but yeah, it was good, man. It was, it was a good time. I'm, it's just so nice to see that we have a, you know, it's not close, but it's a community forming yeah. in the area, in the Rocky mountain region that you, you know, you're going to have something to fall back on at least once a quarter or something. There's something Absolutely. coming down the pike. It used to be, we had LVO and Slobberknocker and that was kind of it. Yeah, that was it. So, but now the Denver guys are putting together really good shows and really good tournaments. So and it's about time too, because like back in Eighth Edition, Denver was a, was a good area. Yeah. For I mean, we used to play pretty big. We did a five man team tournament up there, and there was eight teams at one point. So yeah. I mean, that's that's a sizable tournament, and we are going to be close to that again. Yeah. Very shortly, and it'll only grow from there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, there was a time that, you know, before Feast of Blades turned in, turned into a fiasco, there was a time when, I mean, it was one of the major deals in the yeah. country. Yeah, You know. Exactly. You know, and as, as you'll hear coming up in the show, Flying Monkey, yeah, uh, the, out the convention out in Wichita is not that far from, I mean, going from Wichita to, to Denver is like us going from here to Oklahoma. Yeah. You know, there's no reason why this region, King of the Mountain. Mm-hmm invitational stuff hopefully it will start drawing all these areas back into it and yeah getting us all motivated it's a beautiful thing so it's what we need yeah desperately exactly yeah so all in all man good event shout out to rob and, and chad for running putting that on it was nice to once again send a bunch of guys up from albuquerque and take all your 
toys. Uh, <laughs> we just can't let it go. Can yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, just what we're going to do. It's, like I said, just super pumped, super pumped for the yep. team tournament. coming. I know. So, so I, we've split our folks up and we've got, we've our, got teams our teams ready. And got our, almost got our armies. Yeah. Once again, listening to Ryan, him and Ha about what army he's going to buy three weeks before the event, put together paint, and then sell immediately afterwards. <laughs> I'm not going there. I love you, Ryan. Because I want to make sure I have dibs on the Nurgle army. No. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm uh, kidding. Good stuff. Sweet. So. Well, that's cool. Yeah. I guess we'll roll into. We'll roll into lore here in a second. Lore. The Realm of Lore, where in this week's exciting episode, we're going to bring you two great interviews. The first one is with the organizers of the Flying Monkey Con. We're also going to talk to Chuck Moore, who was the chief herder of cats and driving force behind <laughs> the U.S. AOS Community Pack, which, if you're not aware of it, it's a amazing document that was worked on by a bunch of notables in the hobby, as well as Elric and I, to help tournament organizers and just people that want to get events together. And it kind of covers all those questions you have when you don't know everything there is to know about running an event. This is a resource for you to go to and figure out what needs to be done. What are the things you need to think of six months out and three months out and two months out and a month out. So we'll talk to Chuck because he was the guy, he was the moving force behind that. Other than that, that's going to be our lore section is those interviews because we went pretty long in the new dawn and we had, you know, the coverage of the tournament up in Denver. But one thing that we wanted to hit on ties into our topic from last show, which was slow play. And that is that Reese and Frankie over at Frontline Gaming and the guys that sort of head up the ITC, I don't want to say they run it because it's kind of a community driven thing. They have decided to pull the trigger on slow play in the 40k arena and they are going to at the bay area open institute chess clocks for the at least the top tables at the bay area open i think one of the things he said during the uh, frontline gaming podcast uh, signals from the frontline was that it's kind of going to be a day two those guys that have winning records are going to be using the chess clocks he did also state that they feel like it's it's something that they can try and they can do because, you know, they run so many events. They run War Machine events, so they have, you know, somewhere around 100 or so chess clocks to use. So they don't have that, you know, they don't have to buy anything. And, of course, the flip side of that, too, is there's so many good chess clock apps for the phone and the iPad and I'm sure for the Android devices and all. So I don't think really supplying the devices is going to be that big of a deal. I think the big part of this is going to be public acceptance of the whole thing. You know, if anybody can pull this off, it's going to be the guys over at Frontline Gaming. Yeah, I'm really interested to see how this pans out. I know... This is one of those things that is going to get a knee-jerk reaction from a lot of people, a lot of negative reaction. But the thing is, and it's I know that 40K is not War Machine. I know that's what some right. people say, like, so you can't compare it that way, et cetera. But ultimately, we won't know for sure until we do it. That's right. This may be a huge failure, but at least we will be able to say it is a failure because we tried it and it failed as opposed right. to just what we felt works or doesn't. I'm all for them trying it. I'm yeah. glad they're, they are going to try this and see how it works. At a reasonably large event. I mean, this is the <clears throat> Bay sure. Area Open. This is not, Absolutely. you know, your local RTT. This right. is a thing. And I, I understand there are there's some concerns. You know, I, one of the ones I saw Brad Rellian on uh, Twitter was saying that he fears that it would take some of the social aspect out mm -hmm. of the game that people would be too focused on the clock and their army and stuff like that. And, uh, I can definitely respect yeah. that, that viewpoint. My, my concern would, is that it would shift the meta to a point where certain armies just are no longer viable. Right. And I know some people will say like, well, that's fine. Don't, don't bring those armies anyways. And it's like, well, what if that's, you say thing? that to the point, that it's like, well, what if we're all just bringing basically the same three armies because they're the only ones that we can get through five turns with chess clocks? I'm not saying that's how it's going to be. That's one of my fears. It and is. that fear will be either enforced or dispelled based off these actions. Well, you can kind of see where in the 40K arena, 
they're not changing the the time of the rounds. Right. What they're trying to do is get all five turns in. Yeah. And so you still have the same two and a half hours to do the game. So that doesn't change, but it's going to make it more fair for everyone involved. But you're right, and Relian is right. The games are going to be very businesslike now. It's not going to be any small talk. There's not going to be any, hey, did you see that? That was amazing. No, I'm sorry. Roll your dice, move your mice, hand me the clock. It's my turn. Come on, let's go. Sure. And so. You know, and that makes. They, that may create more confrontations too. But again, and this it, is all speculation. That's right. We don't know it until they try it. So, and that's why I'm glad they're doing it. And, you know, one of the things they used as a data point was Scarry over at Scarcast used that at his, the Barry Bash a couple of weeks ago. And he said it worked pretty well. Now, again, this is, you know, it's the first time. It's been done. So, you know, is that something in a vacuum? I don't know. But it seems like they've used these before and not had any bad, bad feels from it. And perhaps, you know, I kind of really respect the way they're doing it with just day two, just the guys with winning records, just the people that can move on and win, win the whole event. And really, when you're getting to that level, that's when you're really, really concerned about finishing the game. Especially if you have, like, you know, a Death Guard army that relies on being around and strong at the end of the game. Yeah. As opposed to the glass cannon armies that just like to smash you up and turn two, and then they hope the game ends. I think I think they're on to something, and I wish them all the luck in the world. I hope it works out really well. I, I share the same misgivings as you. I think we'll see a shift in the meta. We'll see a shift in what is played. And I think you'll see a lot of cookie-cutter armies because they play fast. Yeah. And I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but you know what changes great. that? Missions. Yeah. More books coming out. The meta is always shifting. Yeah. And that's a good thing. It's and a it, good thing when the sh- meta shifts around because you look at like AOS before Megakin came out. Yeah. And it was just stagnant. It was. It, it none was. of us were motivated by it anymore and all that. Now it's getting some new life into it. A lot. And, and you're and even true. seeing older things come back. Yeah. So. So. That's fine. But again, we can't give into the misgivings without any evidence to back no. it up. And this, yeah, will find, this will give us the evidence we need to say yay or nay. Yep. So that I'm, I'm all for it, for yeah. them trying it. I'm really interested to see how it comes out. And like I said, if anybody has a chance of making it work and making it successful, it'll be those guys because they have the player base. You know, they have yeah. the ITC. They, they have can, experience. I mean, yeah. they're guys that put on massive events. So. Yeah. And they're in it to make it fun for everybody. You know, it's it, Reese keeps trying to make sure everybody knows they're not in it to dictate how the game is played. They're in it to make sure everybody has a good time. And yeah. the people that are playing at that level, for them, a good time is getting a game in that goes front to back, start to finish, and comes down to who, who did better. Yeah. And so I'm hoping that this works out really well not saying it's a great answer for the sigmar crowd i think we're a different group yeah but we'll you know see. who knows it might be something that we investigate and we look at in the future i'm as a community not you and me right. but it's something right. as a community we look at in the future i mean we saw the reaction to our last podcast there was a lot of a lot of people talking a lot of talking Got a lot of feedback on that episode yeah and what i thought was interesting is some of the folks from the uk talked about their experiences with it and we thought we were kind of in a vacuum over here where it just affected us and come to find out no it's not just us it's everywhere right. so yeah so, without further ado, I think we will just kick off into our interviews. Okay, so joining us now is Eric Dobler and Duncan Eswinger from uh, the Flying Monkey GT in Wichita, Kansas. It's going to be coming up in June. How you doing, gentlemen? I'm uh, doing pretty good. How about yourselves? Good, good. So, uh, let's jump into it. With Let's talk about the AOS event you're going to be running First, and then we'll talk about the Flying Monkey, because it's a convention, right? There's going to be right. lots of events. Okay. So let's talk about Age of Sigmar uh, first, and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll, ta- we'll tackle the Flying Monkey as a whole. Why don't you just give us kind of like a rundown of, of the event, like, you know, points, number of rounds, scenarios, et cetera, what you guys are looking for. Well, so it, it's, uh, well, so it's a 2,000-point uh, uh, match play, and we're kind of using a, a slightly modified 
packet like they used at uh, LVO, and uh, those are the missions we're also going to be using. Uh, there's a, just a few rules changes. Is it up on the website right now, Duncan? No, because I'm lazy. Well, so that'll be posted on our website at theflyingmonkeycon.com as soon as Duncan is finished editing it. I'm pretty sure it's done editing. I'm just, <laughs> I just haven't done it yet. Okay, so just laziness. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, one of the things that we have different from the LVO packet compared to what our packet's going to have is that we're uh, allowing people to use square bases. All all measurements on the square bases are going to be from like the flat edges, so there's no like corner measuring or whatever. So make it a little bit more fair, but because we got some guys locally that still haven't converted over from the square or from square to still wow. hanging on, huh? Still hanging on. Yeah. You, know. you got to browbeat him, man. You got to browbeat him. It's two years, man. Two years. Shame. Shame. <laughs> One guy's like, oh, I don't want to rebase like 160 goblins or whatever. I'm like, do it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. But okay. yeah, so that's kind of the main thrust of it, I suppose. Okay. And- um, another thing to add, uh, it is an ITC event. Okay. So awesome. it will be, it, it's a competitive. And another thing to add is that it's uh, a King of the Mountains King of the Mountain qualifier. qualifier. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, very nice. nice. Okay. Yep. That's good. Okay. So. What about how's the scoring going to work, you know, and what kind of awards are going to be given and, and what are we looking at for quote unquote soft scores as far as paint and sports, et cetera? Well, so we're, we're going to have a best general, which is going to obviously be a combination of like your battle points, your paints and sportsmanship and all that stuff. Uh, first and second place, those are, you know, pretty self-explanatory. We'll also have some uh, best in faction for order, chaos, death and destruction. Cool. We'll, you know, we'll have uh, sportsmanships awards. We, we will have a DFL, of course, and uh, everybody's going to get some door prizes and stuff. We want mm-hmm. everybody kind of coming in, feeling like they've got something. What's uh, a uh, awesome what's a DFL award? Really good- <laughs> oh. <laughs> Dead freaking last. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, We're sitting here scratching our heads, going, "I think <laughs> I can win that," but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can win it. <laughs> yeah, I got that one. <laughs> but uh, for our painting, Duncan, you want to cover that one? There's a ton. Sure. So something that's kind of unique about like the Flying Monkey Con. Originally, the Flying Monkey GT that's now turned into the Flying Monkey Con is that, you know, we, we tried to encompass the entire hobby, not just the competitive aspect, but also the painting. So one thing that we've done since the start is we've had a hobby contest. You know, most most tournaments have, you know, best painted, yada, yada. But what we do that's beyond that is we, we do a best painted and we also do uh, like a singles painting competition where if you have an individual model or unit, uh, you can enter in, enter it into a certain category, and it's based on popular vote. So some of the categories that we're offering for uh, Age of Sigmar is best character, or I guess hero in this case. I'm 40k uh, <laughs> focused, so but it's, it's best hero, best squad, best beast or war machine, and then best behemoth. And if you if you want to just come by and just get uh, just participate in that, all you have to do is uh, get a con badge. Part of part of that, if you do end up winning a category, it actually adds 10, 10 bonus points to your overall record. So uh, it can boost you. Yeah, it can boost you. And then we also have our painting rubric, which is uh, an overall 50 points. And I'd go into detail, but I think it's better if you just go to uh, flyingmonkeycon.com and look it up yourself. Some of the categories that we're looking for is uh, a theme for an army, basing, Any kind of conversions, yeah. Yep display board and then the above and beyond aspect one army that i saw we were talking before we recorded with, was at slobber knocker gt and it was one of the rolling bad guys he had a zinch army and if he brings that zinch army he'll probably win because uh i don't know what his <laughs> name was but that would, that would that be james was one the, okay that army blew my mind <laughs> i was i was astounded by that so yeah, if you guys, if anybody's interested and can bring their uh, bring skills like that, I'm sure you can take it. So yeah, painting uh, uh, pink horrors blue and blue horrors pink will blow most people's mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that what he did? Oh no. yeah, yeah. Well, he painted his pink horrors blue to troll me. So <laughs> yeah. nice. nice. And just to get some information out there to people who are interested, the singles painting competition will be taking place on day one. 
And then day two will be the best painted army uh, judging in between uh, first and second rounds during lunch. Something else that I think is kind of, I don't know about Frontier, but something that was brought to our attention last year is that we had this competition, but a complaint was uh, given to us about commission models. And actually, for best painted army and the singles competition, commission work is not allowed. That's, so yeah, that that's we good. felt like that, you know, so, yeah, somebody who, who spends the money that doesn't, you know, want to take the time to do the hobby, it's fine. You know, I, I understand that I'm not a huge painter, but the person who took that's the time. <laughs> 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 I'm, trying to, I'm trying to paint myself better than what I really am. But anyways, <laughs> so yeah, we felt like somebody who who takes the time to really make their models and their armies above above and beyond should be awarded. And uh, so yeah, commission works are not allowed for that. But it's still like if, if you have an army that is commission painted, you still get it judged and it will still go to your overall score. You just but can't win not, the... Exactly. Excellent. That's, that's what I've been advocating for is yeah. that, that you can still get a point paint score up to a certain point but you can't dip your toe in the awards and stuff like that that should go to people who put the time in who did that work yeah well that's that's good are you going to have in the scoring system are you going to have like a favorite opponent or a best game vote or yeah, anything so, like that i mean that'll be in the in the sportsmanship award like pretty much every round you'll it'll be like this was like a questionnaire about your opponent duncan yeah we need to iron that out exactly how it's going to work but we don't want anybody you know, I think the term is chipmunking anybody. Yeah. Um, you know, playing a, a strong army. We don't want somebody to, you know, knock you down out of getting the best general. So we, we really need to focus uh, con- a considerable amount of time to make sure that when we do get to pack it up, you know, sportsmanship needs to be factored in, but we need to make it in a way that somebody can't get chipmunked. So right. we're still working on that specifically, but it's definitely in the works. Okay. Sounds okay. cool. I know, um, David Griffin has a, um, he's using a pretty simplistic sports rubric. It's like five questions, uh, that are fairly objective to kind of, you know, like, did your opponent show up on time? You know, did they know their rules, et cetera, stuff like that. Did they have everything they needed to play? Yeah. 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 Very, very simple. Yes. And no questions. Those are, those are not bad to use. Yeah. I think we had something like that at the last Flying Monkey. We did. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So is Flying Monkey been, an Age of Sigmar event since Age of Sigmar dropped? Or? <laughs> so uh, last year we had our first Age of Sigmar event at the Flying Monkey. It was a skirmish event, and hmm. I was the only one who signed up. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. So you, you're but, saying you won, right? I did win. Okay. <laughs> I have fair, had that happen. Year. To be fair, this year we are doing considerably better oh, than yeah. one. We were already at, uh, I think last time I checked was 14 tickets. Oh, nice. Okay. So, yeah, so we yep. had six left. Unless we... Yep. That's good. That's good. Yeah, way better than last year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, as soon as these guys asked me to come on and do the AOS side, I was like, yes, 100%. All right, well, then let's talk a little bit about Flying Monkey as a whole. Like, what all is going on? Where is it at? Uh, thing you know, how can people? F- well, obviously, the website is probably where they're going to find out most of the information. But uh, yeah, what's what's all going on out there? Well, Eric, you want to talk about Wichita since you live there and I don't. <laughs> what uh, Wichita is the air capital of Kansas, pretty much the U.S. Actually, kind of centrally located. You know, there's a lot of really cool stuff going on down here. Uh, we're bigger than just you know, we're not a, a bump in the road kind of town or anything like that we're actually pretty large we're, you know largest city in kansas really because you can't really mm-hmm. count kansas city yeah kansas city's barely in kansas yeah. <laughs> it's almost right. all missouri <laughs> misery so, as i used to call it <laughs> uh, and the, lo- the location of the con is actually uh it's gonna be downtown wichita at the uh drury okay so there's gonna be a lot of i mean a lot of bars a lot of restaurants a lot of stuff around there when you're not, you know, gaming and hopefully winning a few games. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. That's so I guess good. I'll I'll keep going on that. The hotel that we're at, um, if you go to flymonkeycon.com, this hotel, like, I would say it's arguably the, the nicest hotel in, in Wichita, just, yeah. just based on 
looks and everything. And uh, if you're interested in staying at the hotel, we actually got a really good room block rate for 105 a night, but it gets you free dinner, free breakfast, free wow. uh, boots. Drinks. <laughs> yeah, free drinks. Free, yeah. Oh, wow. Free parking. Yeah, it's it's an amazing place to be, and we got it for a great rate. So a little bit more about the, the Flying Monkey Con. Yeah, it's going to be at the, the Drury Plaza, and uh, we got five different events that are tournament-specific. Uh, we have 40K, Kings of War, Age of Sigmar, X-Wing, and then we also have a Horus Heresy of narrative event. Oh, cool. Um, okay. Well, yeah, and actually that that has been amazing. Um, David Komen is the guy who is running that. And we had tickets uh, up for sale uh, in December, and within five days, he had already sold out of his tickets, out of the 20 yep. tickets. So we were really happy about that. Nice. Um, I imagine. The other event that we have is Beer Hammer, which we don't have <laughs> the, uh, the exact location, but we pretty much know where it's going to be at. But we have Beer Hammer going on Friday night, and then Saturday night, uh, we'll have a trivia night. So after the games are over, you know, typically people want to, you know, go out and drink beer and hang out with their friends and stuff. So what we've done in the past is we've played more 40K. We felt like people, after playing 40K all day, don't want to play 40K. Or Age of Sigmar, I guess, now. They don't want to play anymore. So we're having a trivia night Saturday night where people can come in teams and answer 40K, Age of Sigmar, Warhammer Fantasy, 30K, and other Games Workshop uh, trivia questions. So we felt like it would be a, a pretty fun time to have some laughs and just to unwind after a long day. So, yeah, we, and we got a lot of sponsorship coming in. I don't know. Oh, I think another thing that we should talk about is uh, probably, probably the most important thing is that the Flying Monkey Con is actually a, a charitable event. And we have army raffles that will go on similar to uh, to Nova. Okay. And yeah. The proceeds of, of these charities and the pro, like any profits that we make after you know after prize support and, and uh, our charity, yeah. Yep, and our charity is called Passageways, which is a it's a local uh, Wichita charity. And what they do is they engage with the community and, and local law enforcement, and they try to find uh, homeless veterans in the Wichita area, and they take those veterans and they they bring them into a home. Um, and they try to, you know, get them jobs, get them cars, health care, food, you know, and shelter. We did this last year for them, and we, and we raised thirteen hundred dollars. So oh, we're wow. hoping to, yeah, we're hoping to to keep going with that. And it's a great organization um, that we're really happy to support. And then we have one more organization that we're we're uh, giving to is uh, On the Rocks Ministries. It is a Bartersville uh, organization, which is in Oklahoma. And uh, one of our sister events, the uh, Iron Realms and the Iron Halo GT, they both support On the Rocks. So one thing that we're going to try to do is try to get uh, some of our raffle proceeds to that organization as well. So That's, That's awesome. Yeah. That is way cool. Very cool. I, I like the idea. I've seen this kind of popping up here and there of like raffle armies and then that money going uh-huh. towards like charities and stuff. That's I love that idea because it's a win for so Everybody. many people. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, you have the potential of winning a brand new army fully painted sometime, you know, for like five bucks, 10 bucks, however yeah. much the ticket is. So I always love that idea. Anyway, do you want to talk to us about what the, what's the painting rubric going to look like for the, for the tournament overall? Well, so overall AOS or 40 K, everything's going to be like a three color minimum. And that's not just, you know, I took a brush dipped it in three colors and <laughs> made three strokes on something. Yeah. You mean, like, you know, kind of, kind of sort of have the colors where they're supposed to be. I mean, obviously people paint at different levels, so we're not going to, you know, we're not going to, you know, penalize anybody for not painting very well in, you know, whoever's opinion, but yeah, you know, put them, put them where they supposed to, they're supposed to go. And yeah. So primer and two different colored eyes is not going to make it. <laughs> no, 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 no. We won't physically, take your models off the board, but we will ask you to remove them if they don't meet the painting rubric. Okay. I know Games Workshop put out a, a little snippet for the heat, uh, yeah. kind of clarifying what their painting requirement is, and they have three pictures as examples. Yeah. One of them is like a blood angel that's been hit with the Mephiston red primer and then washed. Yeah. And that was it. And they're like, yeah, mm, this that does not, not it. count it. <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, and then the next one was like, just a really basic paint job, I think. You know, it was the red primer. The bolter was painted a color. 
His helmet was painted, I think, maybe blue. His backpack was painted something else. And then I think he had, like, the Blood Angels transfer on his shoulder. And they were like, oh, and he had a little bit of basing. Mm-hmm. And they were like, you know, this is this is considered tabletop. Barely acceptable. Yeah, you know, we, this would be okay. And then they had, like, a picture of something that was actually painted. You know, not like Golden Demon or whatever, but... You know, pretty nice. To a higher standard. Yeah, and they were yeah. like, "This is this is kind of ideally what we want the standard to be like." So yeah, you you could say it's similar to that. I mean, you know, probably should base your ministers probably have more than a spray primer and a wash. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I got to say, one of my pet peeves, and I uh, I've talked about this before, and it always seems to pop up with 40k, is that people don't base their minis. I know they do these. Wonderful I did not paint understand job. that. Yeah, they do yeah. these wonderful paint jobs, and then it's just this black plastic base on the bottom. I'm like, what are you doing? It takes no effort to get some of that GW texture paint. Yeah. Exactly. Slap it on there, wash it, dry brush it, and you're done. Yeah, and, and it looks <laughs> I feel like you guys uh, are great. talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> I no, just, we know you can't paint. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it just drives me nuts. You see it all the time on Twitter gorgeous models and and it's just like that's not oh i finally finished it and i'm like no no, no it's not done it's, not done. <laughs> it's gonna kill me <laughs> so it's like running a marathon and stopping you know five miles out ah close enough yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> almost done so all righty all right well i think i need to bounce so okay i'm gonna go shower and and uh go taste some food Excellent. As the newly engaged man that you are. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, congratulations. Certainly. Congrats. Yeah. 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 Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on and looking forward to listening to this afterwards. And yeah, if you guys are ever interested in uh, a little bit of Age of Sigmar content and some wargaming content, uh, the Flying Monkeys Wargaming Podcast, go subscribe and listen. It's a little bit of an adult podcast, but if you'd like to <laughs> like some laughs and there's, some There's a good- warning before it starts. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yep. I just gave so, it a sub, so I'll be listening to that later on today. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again, guys. Hey, thanks. thanks appreciate. Thank you. Really thank do you appreciate well. you coming on and talking about it. Okay. So, Eric, is there anything else you want to cover about the uh, the Age of Sigmar we, tournament? I think we hit most of the big bullet points. Like I said, I'm just really excited that uh, it's kicked off in such a big way compared to last year. You know, because Age of Sigmar, like fantasy, sword and sorcery, that's that's like my main check, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sci-fi is good and all. It isn't high fantasy. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. scratch your itch, so. No, no. I hear you. Yeah, and I, I have to say I'm really excited about how more events are popping up, especially with this, like, King of the Mountain thing that the oh, Denver yeah. guys are running. It's all being tied in together. and Because mm-hmm. towards the end of 8th, man, it was, life was pretty good in the yeah. tournament scene out here in what you would call the mountain region or whatever. It died hard when AOS <laughs> dropped. So to see it, it coming back up is is fantastic. You know, we just finished Mile High, Mile High Massacre, High Massacre yeah, last weekend up there and tons of new people, uh, you know, playing. And uh, it was it was awesome to see that that many people in a room pushing models again. So, right. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and keep up with as many ITC events as I can because I guess I'm number five on the ranking. No, oh, yes. really? No, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Got to make a push, man. I said, yeah, I'll give it a shot. Why not? <laughs> yeah, the hardest part is getting a major in. I think sometimes, yeah, because usually that involves like LVO. Yeah, and if you're right. one of the guys helping run LVO, that means you don't get your major. <laughs> wah, wah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but whiner moment. <laughs> yeah, it happens. Well, all righty, man. Yeah. Um, I guess if we've touched on pretty much yeah. everything we want to, want to touch on. Yeah. So if you're listening and you are anywhere near Kansas, Kansas, I mean, it, and Wichita has a major airport yeah, too. So very major. It's, it's easy to get <laughs> yeah, I mean, in we, and out we got of. guys coming from California even. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, check it out. FlyingMonkeyCon.com, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah and if uh, anybody has any questions, how would they get a hold of you? Well, so uh, you can go on our Facebook page for the Flying Monkey Con. That's where predominantly most of the questions go. Also, there's a uh, contact us on the website. Uh, website, yeah. So if you have any questions, just get a hold of us in one of those spots. Uh, Facebook's probably the easiest just because, you know, notification pops up. Yeah. And grab it easiest, but. 
But yeah, I've already been answering a bunch of AOS questions and stuff. And Sounds good. Yeah, I'm super stoked. Definitely. Love to have you on after it was over let, so you can let us know how it went, if that's good with you. Hey, man, that, that sounds great. Awesome. Anytime, anytime I can spread the word of the local scene and Age of Sigmar, I am down. There you go. That works. Awesome. That works well. All righty, man. Well, thank you for, for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me on, man. And uh, good luck with the rest of your podcast. And I'll, uh, I'll be you. listening. <laughs> good Great. luck with your event. <laughs> yep. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, man. Take care. Take care, guys. So, as we promised in the introduction, we will now have an interview with Chuck Moore. Chuck is, among many other things in the hobby, he is the man who herded all the cats and put all the work and effort into the U.S. Age of Sigmar community pack. And if you don't know what this resource is, let's ask Chuck. Chuck, what is the U.S. AOS community pack? Well, uh, I guess the best place to start is, is why it came about, uh, as opposed to what it actually is, uh, to give it a little bit of context. So last year at Adepticon, there was a meeting with a bunch of members of the U.S. Age of Sigmar community at large, people that, you know, high-level players, high-level painters, narrative matched, the whole kit and caboodle. Uh, and that meeting really came about by me talking to Tyler Emerson from Scrubbing Wells with the idea of, Let's try and solve some of the issues that the U.S. group has playing Age of Sigmar because of our vast size and snowballed. And, and we reached out, got with Games Workshop and said, hey, let's have a meeting at Adepticon. There's going to be a lot of people there. So grab some people uh, that we knew the e- emails from. And even at the event, there's a few people that we didn't have the emails that, hey, you need to get to this meeting. So we made sure that they uh, came <laughs> along as well. Fortunately, you guys, this will be your first Adepticon this year. So you weren't in attendance. But uh, uh, I know we were able to get get you guys as part of the group eventually to actually contribute to this pack. So that's, that's been fun too. But at the meeting, we really learned uh, both ways from GW to us, us as the U S group to U S group to GW about issues. And then the fact that we don't maybe understand the issues we each other face. For instance, I, I think the farthest that uh, someone in the UK is probably willing to drive for a two day event it might be an hour and a half. <laughs> I drive an hour and 10 minutes one way to work. <laughs> so, you know, a nine hour drive to Chicago for Adepticon here in a, uh, a little bit isn't that big of a deal for me. So how can we take the really disparate regions, uh, typically five is how it's viewed in the U.S. How, we could, how can we make sure that we encourage all their uniqueness, but still make sure that I or you or anybody can travel and make sure we're all playing Age of Sigmar at its core the same way. So essentially making sure we're all playing the same game, not necessarily having a comp pack, but making sure that there is a unity without homogenization. We don't want a Swiss comp. We don't want a no comp. We just want to play age six. Yeah. Right. So the pack is built towards that uh, and it's broken down into different modules. Uh, as you can see in a table of contents, if you're following along at home, uh, try to hit as many different items as we can, both as a player, both as a TO event organizer and, it's really broken down to three levels within those modules at the local scene, regional scene, and national scene. And really, we just use those as definitions, per se. Now, you might be a local club, but you might be painting on a national level scene because that's just what your club does. But taking these aspects and making your own pack or manifesto out of it is really really the goal, to help people know what to expect, how to get started, and just other things that you know us as the U.S. community, quote-unquote, leaders – see and do and, and advice. So that's what the pack essentially is at its core. I think you hit on it. The beauty of the whole pack, and one of the reasons I was overjoyed to be a part of it, is it's all modular. So once you've downloaded the pack, you can pick and choose the parts you want to take out of it. You might want to have your own scoring system, but you might need help with, say, the scenarios. So you can just pick and choose what parts of the pack you use. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it is released as one document just for ease of download. Uh, I did throw around the idea of releasing it as different modules, but that seemed a little too cumbersome for anybody maybe newer getting into the hobby and, and looking at, why do I need 13 different documents? You know, Just here's one, take what you like. We always try to give options. We want to make sure, too, that this is nothing saying this is how it has to be. This is just ideas. This is just a guide. That was cer- it was certainly a great fun thing to work on because we had so many 
so many of the people who are, I hate to say it, but, you know, again, the Pepsi generation for AOS, all the movers and shakers were there. You want to go over who who all was involved with it? Yeah. So, and I guess it is safe to say that the group itself, so if you look at the photo from back in Depticon, the group itself is much larger than the people that worked in this pack because as we connected with Games Workshop and started finding our own niches, you have different people like uh, that maybe are play testers or writing for the community sites or, or doing their own thing. So um, make sure you just want to keep that in mind. But uh, looking at who is involved, actually on the last page, we have the credits. And One thing we should probably <laughs> touch on while you're loading is where can people get this pack? So it's uh, not the best of website names because this is free, but if you go to sites.google.com slash view slash US AOS community group, uh, that's where the web page is located. The most up-to-date document will be hosted there. And on top of that, you throw us also a calendar uh, and an email. So if you have an event that you'd like to send, we can add it to the calendar. Is it the primary calendar and, and the greatest resource ever? No, but it is there just because I feel it's it's a necessary tool and, and perhaps it could grow into something bigger. Yeah, that's a, um, that's a great resource there. If you'd like to find a uh, easier way there, if you just Google the Realmgate blog, which is my shameless plug of my uh, <laughs> <laughs> twice a week blog in the top right corner, you'll see a uh, link to the site as well. And people should be looking at your blog anyway, now that you're a Warhammer community published author. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, please feel free to tell me how I'm wrong about my uh, Daughters of Cain list that uh, I enjoy so much, but I, not to everyone's taste. <laughs> I, I would never contradict you because, yeah, no, I'm not that good. <laughs> Contributors to this pack, um, let's say there's quite a few. So I kind of headed, headed up, you know, as you said, herding the cats, uh, to put it so nicely. <laughs> um, I also worked on some various modules, uh, making sure everything was uniform, you know, finishing, that, that sort of stuff. Um, the people that really did the work, the, uh, the, the true movers and shakers. So uh, Vince Ventrella of Warhammer Weekly, he did the painting module for us. Uh, Aaron Boston uh, of Nova Open Fame and We Are the Neon Blog writer, he took care of the narrative. Elric, you took care of the scoring module for us here. Yeah. <laughs> and Bill, don't forget, you put out a very lengthy scenario selection module, which is... <laughs> You came out with that so quick, and it really kind of set a standard for what everyone else was working towards. So uh, everyone, make sure you check that one out. Um, also, Tom Lyons from Warhammer Weekly took care of our house rules module, which was probably the hardest subject I think me personally could have handled. So for him tackling that and doing oh, it so yeah. well was beautiful. Yeah, that was an effort there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the social interaction community growth uh, actually had Reese Robbins in a in and he had Frankie, uh, I believe, from Frontline Gaming. They worked on it together uh, just because of what they've done to grow the scene. Uh, whether you love or hate ITC, I mean, you can't deny that it is a community growth type process. So he put his thoughts into, into words there for us. And Kenny Law of Combat Phase did Sportsmanship Module. Uh, and as I said, there was more people, too. Um, so if Kelly Freeborg, Andrea Schwant, uh, we had, you know, Frankie, uh, also be as uh, supporting contributors. And it is safe to say, too, that while we're all focused on our one thing, we all did help each other out. We had the monthly calls, uh, getting together and, and reviewing in a, in a peer group to make sure we're all on the same page. Yeah, I think that was the best part of the whole thing was those calls, those monthly calls and bouncing ideas off of each other and having people give you course correction when you were way off base, you know, like me. <laughs> <laughs> from a personal standpoint I, I loved them because i got to know you guys a lot better uh everyone that was jumping onto the calls and it was also scary too because you know it's like hey i'm just gathering up all these great age of sigmar people and <laughs> they're looking to me for leadership what have i done <laughs> <laughs> well i didn't envy your job one bit having yeah. to ride herd on everybody i definitely give you top kudos for for getting this thing from an idea to a published document is pretty amazing indeed and thankfully, uh, people in this hobby are very motivated, so it wasn't as hard as you might think sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Now, one of the things I'd also like to mention about the pack and maybe have you touch on is now that it's written and you've put it into a great format for everyone to look at, we're not done with it yet either because we're going to continuously revisit this thing as the game changes. Right. So 
looking at uh, Games Workshop, they have their new FAQ format. Uh, so twice yearly, a major FAQ, two weeks after an army FAQ, and then General's Handbook every year. So the best idea that, that came up during our calls was to set this three months after a major Games Workshop FAQ. So if something changes, for instance, in the house rules, say there's something going on that Games Workshop may not be looking to course correct just yet, maybe it's something where we can put in, here's options to help you out. So we're looking to update it majorly twice a year as a, in, as a true living document uh, on those off quarters. So every three months after GW FAQ, we'll most likely have some sort of update on the pack too. And, you know, I'll put it out through Twitter and, and online through that. Um, but it will always be the most up to date on the uh, website itself. Right. And I'll, I'll definitely put a link to the pack in the show notes so that everybody can have it. And I think at some point, I think we've all pretty much tweeted it out and, I, whenever we do an update, I'm sure everyone that's involved is going to tweet it and put it on their Facebook and everything else. Right. And it, it could be minor things. Uh, it could also be major things. We may decide to add more modules. We may decide to change modules entirely. So uh, it, it's really no set process for how we're handling it as opposed to we just want to make sure we have the best document we can to help the community in any way. Exactly. So. Now let's let's give a for instance here. Let's say I'm the guy in Boise, Idaho, and I want to run a tournament and I download this pack. Is there is there's methods in there for me to get a hold of everyone that wrote this thing, am I correct? The main way to get a hold of everybody would be actually just emailing uh our kind of group email, which is yeah. usaos community at gmail.com. And if, like I said, you can email that for events. If you have any questions, you can reach out to that as well. And, and you know, I, I check that every couple of days. Uh, and it's not just going to be me responding. If there's something that pops up that is about the house rule module, I'll, I'll go to Tom who who wrote it, and and we'll attack it that way. Uh, so it's it is a kind of a, a single way to get a hold of us if you're not on Twitter or in some sort of Facebook group with us to talk to us directly. Yeah. So in reality, what you have is not just a printed resource, but you also have a method of getting a hold of the people who think they know a lot about this stuff. So, <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, I would say we're all experts, but, you know, that would be sort of self-aggrandizing since I wrote part of it. <laughs> and I don't want to do that. So, yeah. but I mean, it is a great way because, you know, I'm coming up on a thing where I'm going to get a hold of Vince and talk about some of the stuff in the painting rubric that I kind of want to modify and get his thoughts on it. So, you know, it does work. It, it's a, it's a fantastic resource for that kind of thing. Absolutely. So what else have you got going on besides the community pack? Well, as uh, mentioned before, I have my, my blog, uh, the Brown gate blog that I write for twice a week. Uh, one's a weekly update of all my painting and gaming. And then my Friday one is usually more of a topical piece. Uh, I'm not a, not a reviewer, um, there's plenty of people out there, such as Mango Miniatures on the blog, taking care of that. So I decided to just write from my heart and <laughs> whatever yeah. nonsense decides to spew forth is, is what I put out. Nice. Um, I like it. Lots of Adepticon prep, prep too. <laughs> yeah. need to. Well, fortunately, I don't have a whole lot going on there. I'm just showing up. So <laughs> I don't have to get an army did, uh, for that. Oh, James didn't get your army painted? <laughs> no, oh. no, no, I'm not playing in anything at Adepticon. I'm going up there to help run the GT, so. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. Awesome. And just hang out. Hang out on the first two days, help run an event on the second, on day three and four, and then come back home. So. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I know I bugged you a little bit. I'll probably bug you again, as well as Scott Reed and uh, Alex here in a month or so, because... I guess the other thing, Bill, you might have been hinting at is <laughs> I have been selected to be the tournament organizer for the Nova Open 2018 oh, yeah. the Grand Tournament and Doubles event. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. You, uh, <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got volunteered for that, Emma, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> so I don't envy you for that one bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it, it was... I can't say I was truly volunteered, but um, 
last year at the event, uh, tournament organizer and, and event organizer, that they made some tough calls uh, with how soon the general's handbook came out to the event. They decided not to use it. They really weren't pushing painting or round basing yet, which at, even last year round basing I think wasn't pushed at the national level fully. And I had some honest critiques about it. Uh, the event was well run. I don't want to take that away from anybody, but when you're lining up against armies that may or may not be painted, may or may not be on squares, and you're trying to not look at the current general's handbook because you're using the old one and it's been out for two weeks, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it caused some challenges, and I, I was pretty open about it. Uh, gave some honest critiques, you know, on my blog and everything. So. Uh, when that TO was unable for some personal reasons to take up the mantle this year, it was uh, kind of looked at me and it was put up or shut up. So I'm putting up <laughs> and go outside my comfort zone. And I will be using uh, parts of this pack as well to set up the full full pack for the Nova Open uh, Excellent. tournament. So especially things like the painting pack. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so definitely taking uh, the exact opposite approach. So round bases are required. Paintings, gonna, tabletop quality paintings are required. And actually, that's one thing that I think you could look at this pack and say, maybe we are planting a flag somewhere because I've never been a fan of the term three color minimum because it's just assumed that everybody knows what it means. Yeah. Because yeah. it, can, it, can, it can be game. So I prefer the term tabletop standard. So right. What's a tabletop standard? Well, it you know. Doesn't I'm like, I'm personally I'm never gonna have a model as beautifully painted as as Vince or my or my friend Sean McAfee, but I'm gonna put in the same amount of effort, <laughs> sure. and that's what yeah. it comes down to. Well, and I think all, everywhere that's all we're really asking for is put forth the effort to yeah. make it look good. Not it doesn't have to be Golden Demon or I Walk. It's put some effort into it, like I did. So exactly, and and that's really just uh, I think as a global community what we're after just. Just put forth your best effort. It doesn't matter how good it is. Just put it forth and, and try. Put yourself out there. Get outside that comfort zone. All right. So is there anything else you want to talk about with the, the community pack or the Nova GT or doubles? Well, as far as the pack itself goes, I, I do want to ask the community at large as you're looking at it, if you have any major suggestions, um, including new modules or additions to these modules, uh, feel free. Uh, I know as you said, the movies, movers and shakers are the ones kind of heading this up, but it doesn't mean that that team set doesn't mean that we can't have someone else come on because they have such a brilliant idea and they're willing to head it up. So, you know, please reach out. You know, this isn't some sort of closed group where we're, we have walls up and, you know, we want to be open. We want to make sure we connect with the community. I mean, personally, my favorite thing about this whole hobby has become the community and, and doing everything I can for it. So please reach out. Please let us know if there's any any additions, changes, or critiques you have of it. I mean, you can't hurt any feelings here. <laughs> this is all for fun. That is the truth, yeah. Well, awesome. Yeah, I want to thank you for taking time out of your day and coming to talk to us. Really appreciate it, and I know I set this all up at the last minute, but <laughs> it was just kind of crazy how this week unfolded. So, No, I appreciate you uh, guys having me on. It's uh it's fun. This is now my second podcast I've been on ever. So <laughs> <laughs> nice. you're getting pretty much world famous. You're all over Australia. You're all over. Well, you know, New, the New Zealand. New Zealand. New Zealand. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Dan's going to kill me. <laughs> and now yeah, you're a writer you're for Warhammer Community. Ah, you, you're the guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just the guy that posts Taylor Swift images and. Yeah, talks about elves too much. That's about my life. <laughs> and you <laughs> certainly are the pun king of <clears throat> several chats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I elf, do love it. I work on his toes. Yeah, yeah. But if you would like to follow any of my puns or see when I post my blog or update this pack or see how much I really enjoy Taylor Swift as an artist, um, my Twitter, which is probably the easiest way to get hold of me, is at Odiam O D I A M H. Excellent. Awesome. Awesome. And like I said, I'll post all the links to the pack and the Yeah, definitely the pack so people don't have to try to remember. To remember that, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that will be in the show notes. So Perfect. Thanks, guys. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Chuck. Appreciate it.
So that should just about wrap up the show. want to thank those guys for their time in the interviews today, uh, especially Chuck, because I did his pretty much at the last minute. I asked him to do this on Thursday, and <laughs> then I didn't get back to him till this morning. And yeah. so, yeah, I really appreciate those guys taking time to tell us all about it. And again, you'll be able to see all the stuff for Flying Monkey Con in the show notes. And of course, the, uh, the stuff for... The AOS community pack I will also put in there because that's a pretty convoluted link. So it'll be in the show notes. Definitely. I don't have anything else. You got anything else? No, not that I can think of. Next show, I think we'll probably be post-Adepticon. Yeah, because in two weeks you're in Adepticon, right? Yep. So we won't record that Saturday. No. No, probably. (laughs) Well, we could. No. Yeah. No. (laughs) Be too much of a pain in the ass. Yeah. But the week after you get back. So there will be a three-week break. So, yeah, other than that, we'll see you on the flip side of Adepticon. If you'd like to get a hold of us, you can reach us at our email address, which is rollingbadpodcast at gmail.com. You can also visit our website at rollingbad.com. We have a Twitter account for the podcast at rolling underscore bad. We also have a Facebook page, so you just search Facebook for Rolling Bad. Our individual Twitter accounts, in case you want to get a hold of us that way, I'm at Elric Edge. And I'm at Bill Castello. So, yeah, feel free to reach out to us. Um, We're also going to talk to Chuck Moore. That would be the Fat Matt. Nice. (laughs) Oh, is that what you've been looking out the window for? Yeah. Okay. Oh, Bill. Uh, With the... um, Oh, geez. Total... total Flying Monkey Con? What are you laughing about? I'm sitting here this entire time thinking, Flying Monkey Con. It's a weird name. We're not in Kansas anymore? I know. I know. I feel so stupid for not (laughs) picking up on all the jokes I've had to listen to my whole life being from Kansas. Being from Kansas. That damn movie. Oh, what? It's what put you on the map. (laughs) Other than a couple of lines drawn, but you know. Mm -hmm.